again. We dealt with healing. All right. Now, this is part three. Second Samuel 12. 10 through 14, and now therefore the sword will never, this is the part that I, would, I, did, I actually didn't plan to go back and cover deeply, but now I will. Because we need to. There, and now therefore the sword will never depart from your house. Because he sinned. What we're talking about here is consequences to sin. Consequences to surrender to the enemy. Consequences to surrendering to darkness. Consequences of a father and a parent would be better. And a parent might not be your blood parent. <laughs> but the consequences of sin, period. And it says, the sword would never depart your house because you despised me and took the wife of your right and hid out to be your own. Because he looked at God, knew right from wrong, knew the truth. He still did the sin. God says, you know, no. Because you did this, the sword would never depart your house. When everybody hears that, you mean the kids are going to pay, and the kids are going to pay, and the kids are going to pay, and the family's going to pay. No, no, in this verse here, it's not actually talking about his biological family. It's talking about the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, Jesus was of the house of David. He was a descendant of David. He's talking about Israel. God's saying Israel is always going to be at war. And, and, and when they were at war with themselves, they've been at war with the Philistines. The, you know, you fill in the blank. They didn't have a homeland for 2,000 years. That's what the Lord meant by the sword would never depart. To hear that, that what if he would have done differently? Would things have been different? Mm -hmm. According to God, yeah. But the thing is, there are consequences to good and wrong, right or wrong. Now, um, the next part is on his family. This one. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I'll take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. And, of course, last two weeks we discussed all this. But I'm going to make a different point to that. Uh, David's situation, from David's situation, we learned that there are consequences to sin. That God forgives us. God can forgive us. But he doesn't always take away the consequences. Sometimes it can't be avoided. But most of the time today, when we go to God for repentance, Lord, forgive me, we expect to take away the consequences, and when he does it, we get angry. Then we walk away from him, and we blame him when the death happens. When your kid's in jail, when your spouse left you, when your parents abandon you. There's consequences. I saw a video this week, and it was uh, on a bus, and it was a parent who were strung out on some kind of drugs, and they had their child with them, and the parents were both had fallen over. They're not dead. They're just, they just they're strung out. They're so addicted to the drugs. They were strung out on a public bus, and the people were filming it, and the kid's sitting there trying to wake them up, and he can't. And I, and I thought about that video when I saw it, and I, I wish I'd have copied it. But here's the deal. I can look at that person and go, you bad parents. Look what you're doing. You're addicted to that. And you look, but how many of us are addicted to something else? Mm -hmm. Trapped in something else. And our kids can't wake us up either. It's easy to point out somebody when you can see them in public and they're on drugs. But what if that drug is something else? What if that addiction is something else? What if that hurts something else? And if, if, if something has power over us and we can't stop it sometimes, most of the time, unless it's a medical condition, and it owns us, just like the drugs on those parents in that video. I mean, the one I was telling about. Consequences. And consequences, as David learned, can be very severe. And if you want to understand something, one of his sons slept with one of his wives. 
He had um, uh, one of his stepsons raped his sister. You understand? The things got out of control in his family. Um, consequences. There's a law of consequences that the Bible lays out, and that law is still alive today. It's referred to as the law of reaping and sowing, though. And I use this verse occasionally. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mauled for whoever, whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Nathan, the Lord speaking to, to David said, since you had contempt for me, you knew the truth, and you denied the truth. Since you had contempt for me, there's going to be consequences. And sometimes we get caught up and we know we shouldn't sin. We know we shouldn't go back to that sin. We know we shouldn't recop that same attitude. That, and when we're hearing the Spirit tell us, don't do that, don't do that, and you know the answer, we do. Um, that says, I will not be mocked. Sometimes the consequences on a Christian may be harder than it is for a non-Christian. Do you believe that, Jeff? If the Lord loves us and he says he, he does, I believe it could be that. Do I believe that if time you met, God's going to take your baby? That's not what I'm saying. That was David's situation. Your situation, my situation may be different. But the laws that apply, the laws that apply. Now, where am I going with this? I'm not going with you. think I'm going with <laughs> This isn't going to be a condemning lesson. This is going to be an open our eyes <laughs> lesson. But the thing is, I need to understand there's consequences. And those consequences will affect everyone around us emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually, especially children. People today do not face the fact that there are consequences to sin, okay? That we just don't. Now, the thing about David's sin is it created in, in the nation of Israel a root, right? It created a root of dysfunction in Israel. The sword will never depart. Did God. Who created that? Not God. David did. It created a root of dysfunction in his children. And look what they did. And the grandchildren will be watching their father and then watching their grandfather. And that cycle, you get it? So David created a root of dysfunction that gave the devil an opportunity to destroy his life, his integrity, his character, and his children in his family. You guys get it? Now, that is exactly what the devil does today. You need to understand it. I need to understand that my choices, my behavior, my actions, how I live for God and don't live for God, how I handle adversity, um, I'm either going to Deny the devil an opportunity to attack my family, my wife, my child, attack the church. Or, if I keep following these paths, temptations, whatever the devil puts in front of me, and he could be setting me up to destroy my marriage, my family, my place here. And what was the big sin that God had an issue with? He goes, oh, David, because of your sin, people are going to blaspheme me. And go back last week, we were here. They're going to curse God. They're not going to believe in me because you, as the king, are you as the pastor of that church. Now, people aren't going to believe in God because every time, every time you preach the truth and they believed in you, now they find out you were sleeping around on your wife. Now they curse God. Now they don't believe God. Now they want nothing to do with church. You know who has to own that? Sin, the enemy gives you an offer, opens a door in front of you. Don't take it. Never take it. But let's keep going. Most fears, as I wrote here, uh, the devil used David against his own family. That's what that's that's you gotta understand. The devil used David against his own family. Most fears, dysfunction, and destruction that people have today. Me and Shelly, hey, we've learned something, baby. What's the root? Got a dysfunctional person? Got a person who self-destructs? Got a person with, you know, making choices, running the streets, drugs, you name it. Womanizing, sleep. 
We already, we're smart enough to know there's a root somewhere that causes a person to act the way they act. And you know where it comes from, 99.9% .9 of the, well, okay, 75% of the time it comes from a family. So it's going to happen in the family. The other 25% is they made a mistake. Guys, got it? Okay. Right. Today, I want to touch on some things that the devil uses families against families. The first thing the devil, one of the first one I'm going to come up with is the sin of abandonment. This is how the devil will turn family against family member. And as those kids grow up and they have their own family, the abandonment's still there and it will destroy their family. I mean, I wrote a, I, this story was told by another pastor. Uh, it was in a book. And, he, and, um, and um, Joe Bean, uh, Shelly knows who he is. He's a pastor slash psychologist slash speaker, writes books. Probably one of the best ones out there. He told a story of his daughter that every time he went to another church, another town, another state to, 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 to teach or to preach, right, that she would cry when he left. You know? And I get that. I went off in the name. Something. Drew used to cry when I left. I get it. I get it. But one day, he noticed something. She wouldn't cry in tears of, I'm going to miss my daddy. She was actually crying in and when he paid attention, he saw something different. He saw tears and crying that were from like a person who's mourning the death. She was mourning. She wasn't crying. He thinks going to be gone. They're going to see my daddy. She was mourning something. So finally he asked her, you know, you know, why are you crying? Because he always assumed she just crying because I'm leaving town. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll read his words. Why do you cry every time I leave? Why does it upset you so much? She didn't answer right away. But when she did, she said this. Are you coming back? Are you coming back? What Joe learned here is that she was terrified that he wasn't coming back. Now, there's a family history since he put it in the book, I think we'll get to share it. I didn't ask him. <laughs> Earlier in his marriage, when she was younger, him and his wife got into it, and they split up, and he, one day he walked out the door and never came back. He was gone for three years, I believe it was. Eventually, God put them back together, and the family back together, and the family, well, we're all together now. Daddy's home, and we're together, and we're a family again. But what people didn't understand was that little girl got hurt. And her daddy walked out and never come home. And she still carries that. And people today still carry things that happened to them when they were younger. Even if God has given them, maybe things have got better. The underlying hurt, that pain, that fear, is still in a little girl. So you know what dad did. He started talking to her. He started working with her. And um, because she really was worried and I mean, terrified that when he went and left town, he, you know, he might, he don't, he's not coming back. He don't love me. He left me once. He abandoned me once. He made me it again. I'm glad that happened that day. I'm glad all that come out. So now he could go and start healing that counseling, saying the right things to her. Because here's the deal. Here's what happens. Let's say that didn't happen that day, and it come out. And God didn't give discernment to understand it. She grows up. She's married. Now her and her husband have a fight. Now he's like me and Jeru. We're so honorable that when we get upset, we will never show it. We will never yell and scream. I'm just going to go for a ride until I can walk. I'm going to be an honorable man and I'm going to be what my mama was. But what I don't know is that when she was a little girl, her daddy got in that car one day and drove off and never came back. What does she go through every time I get the car, I get mad, and I storm out of the house? She becomes that six-year-old little girl. The daddy walked out and abandoned me. And my husband is abandoning me. That's not the truth. 
And no matter how many times you explain, no, no, I just need to get time away so I can think. I don't want to yell at you and cuss you. I just have to go think I'm a hothead. Because where she's coming from is, you understand, guys? These are things that are going on in marriages today and grown-ups that the husband doesn't understand what the woman went through and the woman doesn't understand what he went through. And the very things you do to protect each other is actually triggering that person's fears, that person's hurts. And it's destroying marriage. And they'll go from, oh, well, he ain't the next marriage and then the next marriage. And the same cycle happens. And really what happened was something that happened way back in the day that nobody brought healing to a little girl. And how many of us, the reason we say, God, we're going to change, but we can't change because the devil knows how to push those buttons. He knows how to put, make your spouse say something, do something. Jeff, say something or do something. And you're sucked right back into being that angry, abandoned, broken person. Number two, the sin of hypocrisy. What do you have? The sin of hypocrisy? What that got to do with anything? Yeah, everything. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about a little girl. Her name was Joe. She grew up in a Christian home. Mother and father were active in church. Her father was a deacon. When she was six years old, this Christian father entered. Make sure they don't know people. The Christian father entered the bedroom and performed oral sex on her at six years old. This is a true story. This this story has happened in more kids than you can ever count, in boys or girls. This started years of sexual abuse, and it got to the point that even the dad made her, as a six-year-old, perform oral sex on him. One day, she refused, and she was in sixth grade. No more. Can't do this anymore. Well, Dad stopped. Somewhere after she like stopped, I guess he either come to his senses, realized what he had done, was ashamed of what he had done. But he did something that most people would find very noble. He goes to Jody and he asks her to forgive him. And he never molested her again. He never entered her room. He never even mentioned it again. It was like it never happened. Everything's good, right? He said, I'm sorry. Forgive me. No. That's the worst thing that could ever happen. Let me show it to you. The emotion, the hurts, the fears, the brokenness in this little girl, it was a six-year period when it was put into her, right? She has to get up because now Dad's okay. Dad's let it go. Dad's faced it. He asked for forgiveness. Of course, you're going to say, okay, Dad. It ain't that simple when you're the abused. Dad's being a deacon. Dad's singing in the choir. Everything's good. But she's still dealing with the betrayal of trust of a Christian man, a Christian father, who crossed a line that she's never been crossed. And I don't know if uh, he got that or not. I, I, maybe he was afraid that if he went and got counseling for her, but then he'd have to face the authorities. Or the church would throw him away. I don't know what the father's thinking was. Maybe he really just thought, she's fine. It's all gone. It's never gone for the victim until it's faced. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into how what she did with her life, but just let me tell you, dad stole her body. Right? But what he gave her is he could, he... He paralyzed her with the guilt, the shame, the fear. She had no way to heal, nobody to talk to, nobody to deal with it. And how do you how do you understand it when you're six? How do you understand it, all right, when you're in sixth grade? How do you understand it when you're 50? You can't. Because when you look go back to that and you process it in your mind, you're a six-year-old little girl again whose emotions stopped that day. You can't understand it. See, Dad took more than her body that day. He took her heart. He took her mind. He took her life. He took her future. How did he take her future? She can't have a normal relationship. 
She was afraid of her death. He stole her peace, her ability to trust, her ability to have a normal relationship with others, including God. And he also stole her ability to heal. He never told her she couldn't talk about it. He never told her, don't you dare tell a soul. But because he didn't let her talk and let her face it, she's trapped in that world. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if things have changed yet for Jody, but Dad moved on 25, 30 years ago. She's still there. See, Satan uses one family member's sin to bring sin and harm to the other family members. That's good. You know, I've been in new, around youth ministry for, I was in, I was doing directly with youth for 20, 25 years. I know that, right? And I build very open youth groups, okay? I'm very open. People can share. That's how the kids heal. That's how I kept growing. You can be real here. You can share here. People are going to love you here. You're not going to be judged here. People are going to put pour into your life. And we watch these kids heal. We watch their families get healed. And I learned something real early in ministry, the way I do it. A lot of people ain't going to sit in there. I mean, in adult ministry. They're going to sit here and go, yeah, preach. Because they got to face it. They don't want to face it. They're going to get out. They love it at first, but they're going to get out when they won't face it. So here's the deal. Kids will face it. Kids were resilient. All those kids we pulled in for the community, oh, yeah. They wanted that love. They wanted that. They wanted to heal. They wanted to be set free. They wanted God. They wanted love. They wanted their families. Then I noticed something real early. Where are all the church kids on? We didn't actually do it on a Wednesday night. That was a normal lesson. On a Sunday morning, it'd be normal Sunday school. And then we did dramas and things on Sunday night. But on that Friday night, that's where all the kids come from. That's where all the life change come from. That's where we face the real stuff. But I noticed all the church kids who were in the church who's Dad's a pastor, a Sunday school teacher. Mother's the church secretary or the worship leader. Their kids were never there. Let me tell you what I learned about that. I've already told you here before. They didn't let their kids come to a night like that because they were afraid the family secret was going to come out. That told me everything I needed to know. What percentage of Christian kids are being sexually abused? I don't know. I don't know what percentage. But I'm going to tell you this. It's scary. Now, let me show you the magic of God and the magic of the devil. You, ready? you ain't heard nothing yet. Those church kids... I mean, the community kids that were coming in, they're getting saved. They're getting healed. Their families are getting healed. They're getting saved. Did we have to turn some of them to the authorities? Yeah. We did. Did those families heal? Yeah. You know what's amazing is those unchurched kids coming in, getting church, getting saved, and their families getting saved. You know who wasn't getting healed? Say it louder. The church kid doesn't they're not allowed to talk about that stuff. They're not allowed to go to the altar about that. And even if they're told not to go, <laughs> the fear of going and being open. You know, my fear was with Jeru that he would never go to the altar. We never made him be a preacher's kid. But what about it when I, you know, I don't got to be sexual abuse, it could be other abuse. A lot of times I was too hard on him, and I'm beating him down. That has destroyed more families. And why we lost two generations, I, I'm, I'm just showing you straight up, because the parents didn't live their religion at home. And you know, it's worse on the church kids because, especially the sexual abuse, because they are supposed to be what we see God as. And if you're being hurt by someone who represents God, then all of a sudden, yeah. God is just 
Mm -hmm. And it rips God right out of their hearts and their minds. And yeah. it's just it's a spiral in multiple directions. Right. 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 Touch we won't get deep in but where we were going. We're not going to be really mean with this. No. This well, the next one might get you. That ain't this one get you. Set of weakness. I mean, I'm going to thank Joe for his insight on some of this. Sin. Weakness is a sin. It can be. Because it gives the devil an open door. Watch me. Watch me. What do I mean by weakness? Um, let's take Job. Y'all know he lost everything, right? Houses, children, they all died, killed, servants, his animals, his wealth. And at the end, Job got up and tore his robe, a sign of repentance, of brokenness, and shaved his head, and he fell on the ground in worship. He lost everything, but he fell on the ground in worship. Watch this. And he said this to the Lord. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Hallelujah. What well, if you come in here this morning and the, your kids died, your house burned to the ground, everything you lost, would you be Job? Well, that didn't happen that way to Job's wife. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. See, pastors and Christians give Job's wife a bad name. <laughs> she said, first, first God not. You lose everything, and it's see how you're going to feel and how you're going to respond. I hope I would be Job. But if it really happened, I could be Job's wife. The sin of weakness, right? Who, was the de who did the devil go to the Lord? And who did the Lord give? Who was the devil's target? Job. 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 When that didn't break him and he still stayed with God, <laughs> his wife wasn't as strong. Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. devil came through the wife. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't work, Daddy. Daddy. it's okay, it's okay. When that didn't work, Job stayed with the Lord and is okay. My Redeemer lives and all that stuff, right? Watch this, watch this, watch this. Here comes his three Christian friends. Yeah. You're not godly enough. You're not holy enough. you got hidden sin and God's punishing you. You don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. Thank you, Shelly, for messing that up. <laughs> <laughs> so the devil, if you get to a point where you're strong and you can face adversity, you can face hurt, you can face persecution. You can face anything and still worship the Lord and honor the Lord. Well, he's going to find another way to get to you. And he will start in your family. He will look for the weak one. <laughs> and if he can't get it to your family, and you stand up to them, and you don't let it break you, hey, you got friends, here it comes. I'm not looking at anybody in here, so quit looking at me, Shadow, like I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who you are. I, just, I see other people look at me, and I'm like, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to Shadow. I'm not really talking to Shadow. This is what happened. Pastors and Christians give Joe's life a hard time, don't we? I'll accept that a lot of times the attack on you isn't even meant for you. He's trying to take down your spouse. He's trying to take down your husband. This was a spiritual attack. Now, it was actually a pretty brilliant strategy. Can't get Job to go through the weak link. Why didn't he just take Job's wife when he took the kids? When you have a weakness spiritually, the devil can use you. Yes. Why am I saying to us, heal, 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 heal? Face your past. Face the hurt. Face the pain. Come through it. Let God have it. Let God transform you. Because as long as you hang on to it, 
He'll get to your kids and he'll get to your grandkids and he will keep you from being who you are called to be in the world and in ministry or whatever. And he will keep your children and your grandchildren from their calling and their purposes because you have a weakness that you won't face. And then you get the voices in your head. And then they get the voices in their head. Footholds and strongholds and And for those of us who grew up in a home like NF, the, uh, no difference between NF's mom and my mom, the only difference is my mom would beat the living hell out of us every day. I knew she was trying to destroy me from the day I was born. And I didn't then give in to anything. When I met Shelly, I heard Shelly's story and all the little events happening in her life. And I said, no, you're Joe. You're Joe. And then, and then for those of you who know uh, Donette, she cussed me out in church. In <laughs> she was trying to protect me. I was just showing Kelly, this is your life. And it tried to be true, didn't it? it tried to be true or not true? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but here's the deal. Here's where I'm really getting at. My mom has some, had some issues. And there's a calling on my life. And the devil was trying to stop me. And when I looked at Shelly's life, this event, car wrecks, people, sexual abuse, things. Why is everything aligning against Shelly? Here, 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 here. Why? The, the stopper. So when I hear your story, and you know, and why did this happen to me, Jeff? Because God wants to use you. You're actually blessed and you're anointed and you're called of God and you don't even know it. But if we say, if we get trapped in the anger and the hurt and the rejection and the abandonment and the weaknesses, because that will expose weaknesses in us. Most most people who run to pornography, it isn't the pornography. They don't feel love. They don't know how to connect intimately. But what they don't know is as long as you keep doing that, as long as you keep going there, it's going to make you further and further and further and further for me to be intimate because what you really want ain't even that. What you want is this. Mm -hmm. By the way, while you're doing that, mm -hmm. and it gets out, if you're in the wrong setting, in the wrong circle of friends, in the wrong family, they will disown you, throw you away. They don't understand. And in some places, if you have weaknesses, things that happened in your life, you're, you're shunned, not here. Because I realize all my life what has been transpiring. When I look at uh, Sarah back there, ain't nothing but God, baby. Ain't nothing but God. There's two things, there's two institutions that the devil uses, all these that we've seen so far against. That is the institution of the family and the institution of the church. The church family. Find the weakness in the home. You'll own that home. You'll cause chaos in that home. You will destroy that home. Whether it's a mother addicted to drugs or a, a, a father who's all about his job or a kid who's rebellious and the devil's feeding that. And it'll destroy that home. But that's also how you destroy churches. I sent this to Shelly. I'm going to let her read it. But the less obvious and most effective spiritual emotional attack comes through family members or close friends who are believers. Satanic soldiers or demonic spirits work through the spiritually weakest member of the family or friend to spiritually misdirect the rest of the family. Because they all believe in Jesus or God, the Jesus and God, the family or friend doesn't suspect that the weak family member or friend is actually a pawn of Satan. They think the battle is for the weak person rather than through them. Yeah, you're trying to save them, baby, because they're hurting, and you're a Christian, and you want to love, you want to see them change their life, and you're pouring your heart into them, and you don't realize that they, because they have a weakness that you're trying to help them grow and heal, the enemy is really trying to kill you, destroy you, attack you through them. Are you sure you want to do ministry? <laughs> the very people that you love and you help will be the ones that will attack you. If they have a weakness. If they're not willing to face their 
pass to her so we can see. So, if you're a teenager today, who's, uh, who's closest to being a teenager? Hey, I don't know. <laughs> Get your hand out. Sarah, would you read this from a teenager's point of view? Every teenager should ask. <laughs> Every teenager should ask. <laughs> <laughs> Every mother should ask. Yeah. Oh, you just read. Not no, you got to stay. You can read. <laughs> Are my weaknesses, hurts, fear, sin, etc., being exploited to hurt my husband, my children? How can Satan use my doubt and lack of faith? How can he use my temper? What bad qualities are showing up in my children that are replicas of my less than godly behavior? I didn't mean to do that to you. Thanks, Jeff. Is my husband being fulfilled by our marriage, or am I helping satanic forces set him up for temptation? Y'all feel that? I get that. Mm -hmm. You see it? Mm -hmm. But you didn't, we, don't, we don't know that's the devil working against us, do we? And you realize it hurts. All right, uh, every husband should ask. Go, um, jury, uh, let me go around the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you okay, Forrest? Yeah. All right, Forrest, Forrest is the father. Woo! Husband. How can Satan attack my wife and children through me? Are the hours I spend at work teaching my children materialism or denying them love and attention? Does my wife stand spiritually strong without my help? Have I let down my family and my responsibility to be the spiritual head of my of the family? Where are my wife and children heading spiritually, and how have I affected them? You know, we really do impact one another. To build the part where it can be confusing, I think, it says, "Does my wife stand spiritually strong without my help?" That means, have you, as a husband, invested in her, believed in her, encouraged her, honored her, built her up, did it? That's what it's saying there. A lot of men don't do that. See, Satan forces only need one family member, one family member to get inside, and he will destroy families, and he will destroy church families. All right? You guys get it? Is it important to face things in him? Yeah, it, it's important. It's critical. By the way, it isn't saying that you've got to be perfect as a parent. It's just we've got to be self-awareness, and that's what Thor said about NF. I think he has self-awareness. I think. And I gotta ask us, do we have after reading it, do we have self-awareness that how the enemy it could use us and divide us, our families, our children? Alright, where am I? Okay. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Ready? Uh, next one. How Satan uses conflict. Whatever uh, this is a story that our uh, this is a story that played out recently where a husband and a wife lost a child. doesn't matter how the child died, but the child died. All right? <clears throat> if you got to deal with the death of a child, it causes conflict. All right? You as a father, you weren't there when you needed to be. You should have been there, right? What did, what did NF says? Mama, you should have been here! You should have been here! And I wouldn't be dying now. You know what the wife says in a situation where you lose a kid? She don't know how to deal with it either. He don't know how to deal with it. He's blaming himself. She's blaming him too. She's blaming herself too. He's blaming himself. See how the devil can get in your mind and all these emotions? And they say, you know, they're attacking one another. I don't know what the percentages are, but more Calls. If they lose a child, okay. they're done. It's over. Even if in the beginning they try. If they do not get under some seriously good counseling, who understands what they're feeling and going through, 
that marriage won't be saved. And I guarantee you 99.9% of churches are not equipped to handle that. Neither are the counselors. Here's another thing that happens. Uh, you know how parents choose favorites? Choose a favorite child. And let the other know that you like that child over that child. And, and you got Adam and Eve, right? Yep. They had two children. They, one of them killed the other, right? What were their names? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Choose a child. Invest in one over the other. Single one out over the other. You're going to cause conflict. You're going to destroy a family. Um, I'm going to say this. Um, satanic forces, if you don't think the devil is real, get married. Have a family. Be a pastor. Have a church. And you're going to watch the two very people you love fight one another. And when they're done, they'll fight you. Because in their mind, their hearts, they give themselves to the devil. They don't have control of their thoughts. This is very real. A lot of you know people with narcissism or something similar to that. You work for them. You have them in your families. Watch the devil work. No destroy families. No destroy relationships. The next one. Okay. There's some other things that the Satan used against the family I'm not going to discuss, and I could have. Unforgiveness in a family. Listen, if you can't forgive your parents, your parents can't forgive you, or you can't forgive your spouse, your spouse won't forgive you. Here's another one. Parents who set the bar too high that you can't measure up. While that father is 55 to 60 years old, still trying to measure up to his father, living in the shadow of his father, still trying to earn his father's approval, guess what's happening to his children? They ain't getting time. They ain't getting love. Guess what else? The wife ain't getting time. The wife ain't getting love. So now the wife is open to an affair. Now the children are probably going to rebel mm -hmm. because they feel rejected. They feel abandoned. They don't know. You understand how the devil works in their heads and divides families. And, but I'm going to discuss it. The, one I want to, the last one I want to touch here, and we'll be done after this, is one that you probably wouldn't expect to see up here today. Is transgender, gender sex confusion. How, Jeff, what the heck is that? How does the devil use that? You know when homosexuality came on the scene? Worship of Baal, satanic worship. You know where the first mention of transgenders ever is actually in the Bible? They called them, what they call them transgenders, they didn't have that term. Um, they were called the changed ones. Where did that come about? You, this sermon was done three years ago. So you remember. Where did that come? Again, Baal worship, when the nation of Israel turned from God to worshiping the devil through Queen Jezebel and King Ahab, they started with homosexuality in the church, too, because they changed, it from, they changed the theology. Transgender, sex confusion. The um, abortions. Where did all that start? The old worship? Offering, offering babies to mock. Take the babies and throw them in the fire. When they die, we worship the devil. See, what y'all don't know, and what the church doesn't know, and what the pastors aren't preaching, is how can 50 times they vote to kill the baby, kill the baby, even after they're born? Before you realize, maybe there's a spiritual agenda that they ain't telling you. Why are they so driven not to protect the faith even after it's born? It is what's behind the transgender. Now, the people who are having these transgender surgeries, they don't know this. They're a pawn. In the devil's hands. It is demonic worship. It does open doors, gateways into the spiritual realm. 
How is that tied to the family, though, Jim? You ready? Hit those two lines, would you? Mm. Yeah. I ain't going to say a word until you see this. Open your mind and heart and listen. Well, thank you, Ryan, for putting this panel together. It's um, a topic that uh, everybody brings a different perspective to. And if you haven't come to the conclusion yet, this is very complicated. And it has many different layers. And I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get to all of them. But we definitely need to open up a discussion about it. Uh, I, I lived eight years as a female named Laura Jensen after undergoing gender reassignment surgery in April of 1983. I started as a four-year-old kid in 1944. So I'm bringing to this conversation today 74 years of firsthand experience in some way, either living it or trying to deal with it or trying to recover from it. Um, and uh, it's important, I think, to understand that everything that we've heard today is damaging to children. And I was damaged by this, and I have some very strong points of view. Uh, so I hope that um, don't take exception to them. They come out of pain. They come out of real life experience. I'm not trying to be uh, hurtful to anybody, uh, but I think that uh, I have a website called sexchangeregret.com and we get letters from either the parents or the transgenders themselves asking for help after they've lived the life like I did for 5, 6, 15, 18, 20, all the way up to 30 years and they're saying, Walt, well, can you help me detransition? This was the biggest mistake of my life. I've met with people personally. We've had the honor and pleasure of working with people who are now detransitioning. Just recently, a school teacher, a pharmacist, and a good friend, uh, Jamie Shu. I think it's important for us to realize that there is actually nothing good about affirming a young boy, four years old, like my grandma did me. The moment you affirm a child, like my grandma did, putting me in a purple chiffon dress and telling me how cute I was, how wonderful I looked, is the, at the very same moment that you're affirming that young person, you're telling them there's something wrong with them. That you're not right. Yep. That is child abuse. Yes, it is. We need to begin calling it what it is. It's not affirming a child. It's causing them to be depressed and anxious about who they are. And then we go on to inject hormone blockers into them and begin altering their body. Can we begin to understand today from these discussions how destructive this is to the psyche? It's no wonder they end up with separation anxiety and bipolar disorder, dissociative disorders, schizophrenia, and many other disorders that they want you to ignore. They want to block any child from having access to psychotherapy. Yep. The only reason that I'm able yep. to speak to you today is because after 46 years of dealing with this issue, I was able to detransition in 1990, after I had extensive psychotherapy, the very same psychotherapy that they're trying to prevent people from having. Yep. Why? Because they don't want them to detransition. Because somebody like me puts a real bad mark on the idea that it's all good, because it isn't. I've recently written a book, Trans Life Survivors, that has the stories in it. It's painful to get these emails from people whose lives have been totally torn apart. Men, like myself, who was married, had two children, had a career. I was an executive for American Honda Motor Company. One of those therapists who was an advocate for gender change surgery told me that what happened to you as a child wearing that purple dress, the only way to solve that is to have 
cross gender hormones and undergo reassignment surgery. That's the solution. Well, I trusted his expertise because Dr. Walker had actually written the original international standards of care for treatment of gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria. I'm here because he was wrong. I'm here because those standards of care have morphed into what they're using today. They haven't changed much. Yeah, they've gone through revision after revision, but the basic idea is that when somebody comes in, they can self-diagnose their gender dysphoria. We are manufacturing transgender kids. Yes. Yes. We are manufacturing their depression. Yes, we are. Their anxiety. Yep. And it's turned into a huge industry that people are profiting from after kids' lives are completely torn apart. The most vulnerable people in our society. Yes. And adults are tearing their lives apart. It's really beyond my understanding why we're even having this discussion. Yeah. Because it shouldn't be happening. I don't believe any doctor who injects a young person with hormone blockers should have a license to do so. I would prefer that they not have that ability. And I hope that people began to realize this and began to speak up about it. There is absolutely nothing good about affirming somebody in a cross-gender identity because it destroys their life. We won't see the consequences of what they're doing today until 10 or 15 years later. And there'll be somebody else speaking up like I am, saying, it was horrible what they did to me. They never should have done it. The people are suffering. We're not trying to minimize their suffering. But why do we abuse them with hormone blockers and cut their bodies apart as a way to affect treatment? It's insane, actually. It doesn't make any sense. If we just pause and take a sober breath, it's insanity. When will we finally grasp this? Christina Olson, a research psychologist in Washington, at Washington University, and I wrote the article, it was published in uh, Public Discourse in 2017, June. She said, we do not know who the transgender kids are. One way or the other, we don't know who they are. That's right. Do you get that? We don't know who they are. Does that should sink in? They cannot actually identify who trans kids are, except by them saying so. There is no test. There's no proof. A parent can actually cause a kid to be gender dysphoric by affirming them. The APA, which an article is going to come out in the Daily Signal in the next couple of days that I just finished last night, the APA in their handbook in 2014 says kids are not born transgender. And yet, we're treating them with medical treatment as if they were, and trying to alter them. They're not born that way. I want to say it again. We're manufacturing transgender kids. None of us should be a party to altering a kid's mind, his psyche, and sending them down the path where they're going to sit up here and say how their life was tore apart. And I'm, I'm the fortunate one. I got sober. 
I'm 33 years sober. I drank heavily and used cocaine as a way to try to mask the pain from having undergone the surgery as a way to cope with what grandma did in a purple dress. It confused me that when I was a little boy at four or five and six years old, I, I began to want to be affirmed. Yep. I began to enjoy being affirmed. Yep. I be, became addicted to the affirmation yep. and the attention. Yep. I mean, if a kid wants to steal all of the attention out of the room, all they have to do is say, I'm transgender. They can suck the life out of a room in a heartbeat. And the focus is right on them. And they can get anything they want, can't they? Nobody calls them out. Nobody says, how do you, how'd you come to this conclusion? Well, we know how they came to the conclusion. Here we go. Schools are giving them books. They're indoctrinating them. Parents are encouraging them. Online, they're in chat rooms. Suggesting groups of kids become transgender. It's a fad. Yes, there are people who are autogynophilia, but there's also people who are deeply troubled. Over 50% of the people that I've worked with, hundreds of people that I've worked with over the last 10 years, were sexually abused. Yeah. Boys who are abused at a young age come to the conclusion that the only way they can prevent themselves from being sexually abused again there we go. is to cut off their genitalia and become females. In their mind, that is their defense mechanism yeah. for sexual abuse. Yep. Girls who are sexually abused want to be men as a way to fend off any intruder or sexual abuser because yep. they will no longer be attractive for sexual abuse. Yeah. Yep. Whether it's men or women, vast majority of them were abused as children. Yep. Many of them I sit with and talk with privately are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s before they're ever able for the first time to disclose they were sexually abused. It's too painful. I was sexually abused at nine years old multiple times by my uncle. When I told my parents I was sexually abused, they said, oh, Uncle Fred wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Wrong. They said I was a liar. So now, I had worn a purple dress as a four-year-old. I had been sexually abused, and now I'm a liar. You know, it's not a real good way to start off life when you're not only nine years old yet. We've got to start helping the young people and when people ask for help from me, I have one simple thing I always ask them. Tell me what caused you to not want to be who you are. 100% of the time. That's right. They can tell me. Somebody did they can tell me. I'm, I'm feeling the pain right now of them sharing with me some of these stories because even I weep. They're ugly. They're horrible. They're so deep, nobody wants to talk about it. But we better start talking about it. Amen. We're ruining an entire generation of That's younger. right. That's right. And it's serious business. I'm not pulling any punches anymore. Amen. And you shouldn't either. Thank you. Is, is the church is not protecting families. We're not protecting children. And two different countries in the West, I don't mention their name, one's up north, one's in the Europe, the UK, I don't mention the countries, they have made laws that if you as a pastor or counselor tell, try to take them to therapy for what they're dealing with, or they're, if a preacher tries to say, you know, homosexuality, you will go to jail. Pastors have gone to jail in the UK and in Canada. Why would we make laws not to even... There's an agenda. Go back to the root of that agenda. It's in the Bible. It's called Baal worship. It is demonic. And who's fighting for these laws to give men access to little girls' bathrooms? Why would you do that? 
you get a pedophile's line, open door access to children's bathrooms. Why would you do that, President Obama? And the people that were doing this? Why would you open our children up? Destruction of the family, destroying society, anti-God. What is behind all this? It is the bomb. Now, don't confuse. Uh, I forget what movie it was or what show it was. It's like the exorcism. But what movie was that in? Um, what the church has to, what Christians and the church has to understand is this. So, so that nobody who might be watching will get a misunderstanding. The exorcism. Remember the girl looking yeah. like you? <laughs> All right. They weren't there to hurt her. They were there to get rid of the demon that was in her. 78% of transgenders, after they have completed their surgery, and, I, and they should never release this, the LGBT community released this stat two years ago. 78%, 78 out of 100 people who completed the surgery attempted suicide after they completed the surgery. It's a little too late to go back now. Yeah. It is destroying a generation of children who are confused and a church who isn't standing. The issue isn't the person. The person has been abused. Not love, not wanted. Something went wrong. So we don't attack them. You don't attack, you know, you help them. And one way you help is to stop this junk in, in, in the world. And the churches that will stand up against it, then nobody will. So in closing, in closing, um, closing thoughts. The devil uses families against themselves. If you sexually abuse your child, the damage that's going to be done and the hurt that's going to be done, especially with the sexual abuse. I have learned that the root has a root. Me and Shelly, we've been looking for the root. Why is that girl promiscuous? Why is that boy into pornography? There's a root. Mom was mean to him. Daddy did something to him. But the root has a root. Anybody figured out what the root is to the root? Say it. The root of the root is the devil, Satan, the thief that is that is somehow got inside that father's head to go to that little girl's room. That gets in the middle of that marriage that causes that father to walk away. To get inside a Christian's heads who know the truth, who've heard the truth of the Lord, who knows Jesus can heal them, but because we won't heal, because we've got voices in our head that we won't fight, we won't stand against, we won't change, we won't do what's required by God and let Him heal us, we're going to put it on our kids and our grandkids. So before we get upset with that father who sexually abuses his child, a lot of us Christians, we're doing it every day. Our family is just as bad. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes up and kills, steal, and destroy. 1 Peter 5 8, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, cries around like a roaring lion, they for somebody to devour. Mm -hmm. Now there is a choice. David had a choice, by the way. Uh, rebellion versus repentance. You got Galatians 6, 7, 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, one will also reap. As I told, I told that young girl I've been with the last couple weeks, be the example. Be the example. If nobody else is going to go to church, go to church. If nobody else is going to pray, pray. If nobody else is going to honor God, you honor God. And you will lead your kid to the truth. You will lead your husband to the truth. But if nobody... In other words, you do the right things, the Lord says you will reap what you sow. Do the wrong thing, and you reap what you sow. Now, let's keep reading. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, how does this play out? Here's the rebellion part of that. For the one who sows, his, sows to his own flesh will reap... Uh, <laughs> uh, sows from the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. 
David sold to his flesh. He, he, he sold into his flesh. He took over with Bathsheba. And he ended up wreaking corruption in his children who even slept with one of his other wives. Where is repentance? But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. I can't deal with Jeff. I can't think. Yeah, you can. And the Spirit of God you can. God can get you through it. He can get me through it. Yeah, I can. If you sow in the Spirit, you will reap in the Spirit. And God will. The magic that God does in you to change you and heal you, you'll do in your own family. But who in the family is going to be the one to repent, to do something? And here's another. Um, Marianne, read me Exodus 24 through 6. You shall not make yourselves any idols, no images of animals, birds, or fish. You must never bow or worship it in any way, for I, the Lord your God, am very possessive. I will not share your affection with any other God. And when I punish people for their sins, the punishment continues upon the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of those who hate me. But I lavish my love upon thousands of those who love me and obey my commandments. Mm -hmm. David made an idol of himself. He made himself a God. I'm not going to listen to what God says. I know what the Lord word of God says. I know I'm supposed to I know I'm not supposed to kill. He killed you know, her wife, her husband. I know, I know I'm not supposed to take another man's wife. I know premarital sex. I know these things, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm my own God. And we say today, I'm, I, I know I'm not supposed to do what David did and have sex outside of marriage. I know I'm not supposed to, you know, I know I'm not supposed to stay in my depression, my anger, my hate, hate myself, and, 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 and I refuse to hate. When we do that, we make ourselves our own God. Now, you can claim that Jesus is the Lord and he's on the throne, but as long as you're still living like that, word, actions speak louder than words, and that's what the Lord's going to look at. He's going to look at that. He's going to look at our heart. He's going to, you know, oh, um, what God looks, he knows my heart. No, he knows your actions. But you have to make a choice. Now, that being said, well, this is it. The rebellious part is where we make ourselves God, or we have somebody else, or we find another God that tells us we can do whatever we want to do. The repentance part, if we repent as Christians, parents, if you've been sexually abused or not sexually abused, if you've been the abuser or you've been the abusee, if you've been hurt, if you're the one that did the abandonment, or if you're the one who's been abandoned, there is repent, there is hope. See, David could have put on his family two things, one of two things. He could have cursed his children, or he could have blessed his children. But the children who were the victim of dad, now they got a choice to make. Does the sin stop with me? Does the dysfunction stop with me? Or do I give in to it and repeat it? And that's what Annette was speaking about between the two songs. Don't let me become the very thing I see in his father's. So this morning, I know it's late, but these last three days, these last three sermons are critical that we understand them if we're going to heal this community, we're going to heal this world, if we're going to heal ourselves. So I don't know if there's something you're still hanging on. Maybe you're the, the little girl who was sexually abused in that one story. And even if your dad said, I'm sorry, you haven't been able to tell anybody and you've had to carry that. And you might not just be a girl, you may be a boy. And it might not be sexual, it may be physical, emotional, mental, it could be a lot of things. Or maybe somebody has abandoned not love you. You may be facing it already if you are, praise God. It, some, this is a process. But if you don't let God work through you, if you don't search for the truth, you will be put in bondage. It will trap you. It will destroy you. And it will destroy those around you. I know. I know. So, got a song? Same song I've been playing for the last couple months. And, uh... Mm -hmm.